Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Revisto webinar, Unlocking Innovation, Exploring Revisto 5.14's new features. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, just a few things to go through before we crack into it. Um, start with the acknowledgement of country. We begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today and pay our respects to their elders past and present. We extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Start with a bit of an agenda. We'll go through some housekeeping and then an introduction of our speakers today. We'll be covering the custom statuses, QR codes, augmented reality, all features combined, some additional enhancements and a QA with our speakers as well. Uh, so just to run through the housekeeping to start with, please ensure your devices are muted. The webinar is being recorded and the link will be sent out tomorrow in the Zoom follow-up email to all registrants. Please use the chat to engage with the speakers and other attendees. You can use the QA to submit your questions through the webinar. We'll be answering them all at the end. Keep an eye out on the polls and please participate. There'll be two polls throughout the webinar. And to keep up with future webinars and events, please follow Revisto on LinkedIn. So introducing our speakers today, we have Matt Guns, the Implementation Service Manager for Australia, and Michael Richards, the Customer Success Manager at New Zealand. So let's start today with a poll. Uh, the question here, which feature are you most excited about? If you can answer that, it should pop up on your screen um, and we will share the results. We'll just give it maybe 30 seconds, maybe a minute. Let people have a few answers here. See them rolling in so far. Looks like a good split between the augmented reality AR and the improved clash automation. Right, well, what we'll do now, we'll move straight into it. Start with the custom statuses. I will hand over to Matt, who's gonna share his screen and we'll go from there. Thank you guys. Uh, I'm gonna sh just share my screen. Um, I'll go. One second, share screen. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Uh, hopefully you can. Okay, so custom statuses. Um, custom statuses is a new feature that's just been brought on um, and it's been brought on partly due to uh, client engagement and feedback. Uh, so I'm just going to go to the next page and press play on the video and show you this while I'm um, talking about it. Um, so, you know, custom statuses, uh, we, we've had our standard, st standard statuses for quite a while, um, you know, open, in progress, solved and closed. But when we look at large, complex projects, uh, that's not really going to fit um, perfectly around a lot of these complex delivery projects. So we, we've built our custom statuses um, and uh, basically we can build our own workflows around a different uh, sort of arrangement of um, workflows in the industry. So I'm just gonna let this video uh, continue. You can see some examples up here around you know, coordination, prefab, equipment install, multi-trade. Uh, so there's a whole different array of workflows that we can uh, use uh, with custom statuses. And then you see here, they're also used in our uh, dashboards there to get a better understanding of how the projects are stacking up. Uh, just let that video finish. Now I'll move on to the next page. There we go. So here I am, uh, the next page. I'm gonna walk you through uh, a few steps on how we build the custom statuses. I'm gonna do this online here, uh, and then I'll do a live demo for you. So custom statuses, uh, they're generally built um, in the workspace. Uh, so this is where we make them. And just to be aware, 
uh, they're really run by the administrators. Your general users won't have any control or privilege over this. They're just going to be able to utilize these customer statuses. There's a few other things to note. Generally, recommendation is if we're going to use custom statuses on a project, I recommend most people upgrade to 514. If we do have clients that are on um, 513 or earlier, uh, they won't see the custom statuses. What they will see is a link between the old statuses and the new. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. Um, so I'm sharing the screen here. You can see the standard workflow. So down here, we've got the open in progress solved, uh, and you can see an example here of a custom status workflow that's been created. This one here is drawing review and we've got for review, comment and approve. Now jump to the next page. In here, you'll see uh, a little bit more of a detail on how this is built. So when we go in there and create our new custom workflows, we're going to go in there and group, give it a name, drawing review, and give it a description. Once that's created, we go over here and we see the drawing review and the drawing description up the top here. And then we can come down and build our statuses. So by doing that, we'd want to go down to the bottom here where it says add status number three on the bottom of my screen. And that will pop up with this little page here, number four. And you want to give your status name. So uh, you've got 16 characters to, to build that. So just be aware, don't make it too long because we can't have more than 16 words, uh, characters, sorry. Uh, and once you've done that, that will pop up the top here. Now, you see at the top here, this custom statuses are built. We've got next to them categories. So we have to do, tracking, and completed. Uh, these are relevant. Um, because they're also useful when clients are not on 514. If they're on 513, uh, then that will see a link between these. So just to be aware, if somebody is still on 513 and they don't have, um, and custom statuses have been deployed, then anything that is to do category will be open. Anything that is in uh, tracking category will go to in progress. And then anything that is completed will go to close. So just be aware of that. If your projects haven't been fully upgraded, uh, that's how you will see that. Once you're uh, created your custom statuses, you can also add your uh, associated issue types. So on the left here, you'll see drawing review process, and that's how we select from the drop down which issue types we're going to use. So I'm just going to um, jump out of this and do a little bit of a live demo in here. So I'll just open up my Revisto workspace. You can see now I'm in my workspace. To get here, you want to go to your project. In your project, you'll scroll across and see issue workflow. Issue workflow is there. Now you can see that I've got my standard workflow, my drawing review. Now I'm going to make a new workflow. So I'll go up here and press new workflow button. And in here, I'm going to call this one site tracking so i'll call that site tracking and i'll put a description down there just put that in there so it's good to have a description so we understand what it's doing once that's done hit create and now that takes me in here so you can now see uh the standard default uh, statuses that are here. Now we can delete these, we can get rid of them, but first of all, we need to build some new ones. Uh, so you can also see on the left here, uh, site tracking, the name has been brought in. You can see that there, and we can edit these with the little pencil next to that and the description. And you also have uh, some options here for resolve clash groups, uh, set issue status two close and if you want to change the reopen clashes set issues uh, status to open so you can customize these here also uh, and then the associated issue type is built here but first of all i'm going to make um, a couple of new statuses so i'll come down here i'll press this add status button that opens up this one and first of all i'm going to make a custom status around planning so if I go in here, I put planning in there. 
select that, add status. That comes into this page and then asks you for your, your name and your description again. In this instance, I'll just put planning in there. And then we come down here and we ask the category where we're going to link it to. So you can see here, planning is a to-do action. So I'll give it a to-do category. Once we're happy with that, we can give it a color down the bottom here, customize how we want to do that. I generally follow my colors almost in alignment with the um, standard colors from the default uh, workflows. Um, it just makes a little bit more sense to me, but you can, you can choose how you would do that. So I'd hate to hit that, hit add. You can now see planning is created. So if I do two more, I just want to do two more quickly. I'll do one around tracking. So I'll make a tracking workflow in here. Paste that in there, hit add. And then once again, I'm going to select my tracking category. I'll just place tracking in there and now I'll give this a color. So I might make this one orange like so, hit add. You can now see uh, that these are being built up here and I can soon I can go through and I can delete my uh, default um, statuses. So I'll make one last one. I'll come up here. I'm gonna call this handover. Uh, copy that, I'll paste this into here, handover, hit add. You can see the handover is put in there. I'll put the description up there. And then finally, I'm going to select a category. So I'm saying this is completed. And I'll go down here and I'll give this a green color. Now I'm happy with that. I hit add. So there they are. I'll uh, minimize my screen a bit so you can see that a bit better. So you can see they're all there. Now, if I wanna get rid of these ones at the top here, the default ones, I'll just come up here and hit delete. And that's saying, where do you want these to go? So delete status from the workflow, it's asking which one are you going to link that to? So in this instance, I'll say that goes to planning, delete that. Um, and then I will just go in here and say tracking um, or in progress, I'm gonna send that to tracking down here delete, um, solved, I'll send that to handover. And likewise, I'll do that with close. I'll delete that last one and hit delete. So there they are. Well, I've just built a basic little site tracking workflow uh, and you'll be able to go and deploy that. Now, the last thing to do is create your associated issue type. So if I come down here, I press add type. I come down here and I'll just say site tracking again. Um, or oh, new type, sorry. I'll give that a name. I come up here and go site tracking there and I think it's good to put a, d a description in there, but in this instance, I'm just gonna paste uh, the name in the description. Now you see the choice there to link it to the workflow. So site tracking, if I hit the drop down, you'll see the standard workflows, the drawing review workflow and the site tracking workflow there. Make sure that's linked to that one. We come up here where we see the icon, we can just give it a little image. I'll give it uh, the green tick like so, and now I'm gonna hit save and that will be locked in. So now if I come over here and I press back, I'll zoom out. You can now see my new workflow has been created. Site tracking, tracking, construction process there, and you can see planning, tracking, and handover like that. Now uh, I'm gonna go into Revisto and show you how we would utilize this. So uh, if I come up to here, I'm in a drawing, for example, uh, I want to come up to my uh, stamps and drop a stamp in my drawing. So maybe I'm down here in the drawing, I've identified a problem in this corner. I'll say uh, that this one needs a drawing review. So I'll come in here and say, Mr. Architect, let's drop a stamp there. 
that's now pasted in the model. You can see that's uh, in the drawing, sorry. Uh, and now on the right hand side, you can see the uh, type here, the issue type. So I could now come over here and say drawing review. Uh, and then I will come over here and say it's for review. Hit OK. And now I've locked in my custom status into the drawing. So that's a little example of custom statuses uh, and how we utilize them on the drawings and the models. So I will jump back into the presentation uh, and we'll look at the next topic. So I jump back into here. Uh, and next up we have QR codes. So I will mute myself and let Michael speak now. I think uh, Jack has another poll for us first. Uh, sorry, yeah. did I miss that poll? It's all good. I'll just quickly launch the second poll. Uh, it's just around custom statuses. What type of custom status workflow would you implement in your organization or project first? So again, you should see that pop up on your screen fairly soon. Most people are interested in the improved clash statuses. Uh, with a few on the QA, QC, and the field related statuses as well. So it looks like uh, improved clash statuses is the popular one. So good to know. So <clears throat> now we can move on to the next one QR codes. So uh, I'll let Michael Richards um, talk about this one. So over to you, Michael. Right. Thanks, Matt. All right, so QR codes are brand new and have been introduced in 5.14. Uh, we've got another short video here on QR codes. So Matt, if you could please play that one. All right, so what this video is showing us is really that we can use QR codes however we want. So previously you could generate QR codes by using the URL that you had for an issue and create a QR code through a website to do that. But now you can do it all from within the Revisto app itself. Um, so one option is taking your QR codes, physically printing them and attaching them to equipment on site. That QR code can be scanned by your site team and give them access to all of the information that's in that Revisto model. Um, if these QR codes relate to specific issues, that also empowers people to contribute to the markups, update the statuses of those issues and so on. And that's where you can start to take advantage of the custom statuses and workflows that you might have set up as Matt was just displaying. Just let this one finish playing and then we'll go to the next slide. All right, next slide, please. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, these videos are tricky. I want to go. There we go. All right, so we've got two things that we can generate QR codes from. On the left side, we're showing that we can generate QR codes from selected elements. And on the right side, we're showing that we can generate issues from, sorry, generate QR codes from selected issues. So if you select elements, for example, each selected element will have its own QR code generated. Uh, when you're generating that, you can choose to focus your viewpoint on the selected objects or inside the object, which is useful for rooms and then inclusion on things like room data sheets. Um, you can also choose when you select the object whether or not you want to see its properties and whether or not you have that open on the screen once you open that QR code. Um, in the side app as well, this opens up the properties window, and then you can close out of that to see the 3D viewpoint. So it depends on what you want to be able to see with these QR codes. For issues, in the issue tracker, you go to the top right of the screen, you have your three dots which give you the more options, and from there you can click generate QR codes. Now when you select that, it's going to go into a screen that is very similar to the multi-edit options, which is allowing you to select as many issues as you want, up to 1,000, and then you can generate QR codes from those. So there is a hard limit on 1,000 QR codes that can be generated in each go. Uh, next slide, please, Matt. Thank you. Um, yep, so a limit of 1,000 QR codes, and that's because it's being generated into one PDF document. So if it starts getting bigger than that, it becomes pretty impossible to generate and handle at the same time. Um, but obviously, once you've got that PDF, you could put it through Bluebeam, you could put it through uh, Adobe or anything else to split it into individual pages to then do things you need with it. So say you wanted to include it into an InDesign document or you wanted to print them individually to put on site. Um, they'll be in a format that is appropriate for you to either do from a small 
handheld printer or just do from a regular printer, photocopier, anything else. Um, now, one thing to note is that when you generate a QR code, there's no comment added to the issue tracker or anything that tells you that a QR code has been generated from that element. But if you generate a QR code today and somebody else generates a QR code tomorrow, if that's come from the same element or the same issue, it's going to take you to that same location. The QR code is going to generate the same information. Um, so as long as that issue isn't deleted or loses track or the element isn't deleted and replaced, then that uh, QR code is going to take you to the same information. Uh, the other thing to note is that you can read QR codes through most phone cameras. So you just have to go through your camera application. Or if you've got an older phone that doesn't have that ability, you can do it through things like the Google application on your phone. And now I will pass back to Matt for augmented reality. Thanks, Michael. OK, guys, so next up is the AR augmented reality. So I'm just going to go in here and press play on another little video, and I'll talk you through this as we go. So uh, another one which has been heavily requested by all our users was AR. Um, it's just another way of validating our projects and understanding what we're designing, what we're building. Uh, and it's a real game changer in terms of understanding um, and validating our models and, and our designs. So you can see here on the screen a little example uh, where all the pipeworks running, where all the new services are going to be running in the plant room. And you can do a little validation right there pick up on the object and see what object properties and stuff like there are. <clears throat> so I was really unsure about AR when it came out. I wondered, you know, how is this going to really work in the real world? But I got a couple of examples from some clients that have been using it and sharing um, how it's been working for them. Uh, and I just wanted to run through them and show you quickly. Um, uh, come on. Next slide. No, it's not playing games with me today. Okay. And I just want to credit two of our um, users, Jonathan Dutton and Anton Shaw. They both posted some videos up, which were really awesome. Um, and I just wanted to show that for a second. Um, I will just need to jump out of this one for a second. Oh, sorry. Bear with me for a second while this lets me. Okay. I'll just share my screen again. I've got a couple of client videos now that I just want to share with you. So here we have uh, an example of one of our clients utilizing the AR on site. Uh, and first of all, he's calibrating his model. So you'll see here, he's using the calibrate by corner. There's a couple of op options, but I think calibrate by corner is the most recommended choice. It's gonna give you the most correct alignment and positioning. So calibrate by corner, you see he's selected the structural column uh, and he's picked up his model in the, and, and it's picked that corner point up perfectly. Now, as he zooms back out, you can see the little scroll bar at the bottom, as he moves his mouse across, you'll see the model come on and then the real environment come on. So you can see in this real environment, there's a set of stairs with some scaffolding around them. And then as he moves the bar across, he sees the model and he can validate what's going to be built and what needs to come. <clears throat> uh, I, I really think this is a game changer in terms of just validating you know, exactly what's happening. I spent a bit of time on site uh, a while ago, and I remember plumbers quite often being guilty culprits of running their uh, drainage systems in the completely wrong spot, come out on site and see that the uh, the ductwork needs to run here and the plumbers have gone and put their pipes through there and now all of a sudden we've got a major problem on site. So this really helps validate and, and prove the point. Um, I'll just jump out and show you one last one. Just want to come up here and show you this video also. Just examples from clients and how they're using it. So another one here, we can see two, two images. We can see uh, it working um, on the screen, but also how he's using it with his hands there. And so you can see moving around, he's using it on the iPad. Once again, it looks like a commercial fit out. 
we can understand where all the services are running, understand the complexities in that built environment, uh, and then see how uh, all the models are stacking up. So I'll just jump out of that. I'll jump back into our presentation and I'll hand back over to Michael. So. Um, right. Yeah, over to you, Mike. Yep, so Matt and I are gonna share this slide, but what we're gonna talk about it is just some of the additional enhancements that have come with 5.14. So we're gonna go through transforming multiple scenes, um, the status of protocol RFI is no longer being linked to the RFI and sorry, linked to the status in Revisto. Um, Z fighting, which has been removed in 5.14. The ability to see project members, companies, departments, and location in various places in the application site and workspace. Uh, the batch creation of search sets, screen space ambient occlusion, real-time shadows, filter by location, draft comments, oh. and the new version, which has come out just today. So Matt will start off with the first few and I'll pick up the rest. Yep. Just jump to the next slide. So first off is uh, the multiple uh, transforming of scenes. Sorry, this is just jumping from slide to slide. Going a bit crazy on me. Um, multiple transforming of scenes. So uh, for those that may be aware, we weren't able to do this. Um, we had to do it all scene by scene and Think of an example where you may have 20 models that have come in, they're all in the wrong position, but we need to transform them and get them rotated around and fit the rest of the design. So previously you had to go through, select one by one and go through and transform that scene. Now you can come in here, right click, select you know three or four different models, go down, transform, realign and get your models in the right position. So it's a little bit of a time saver there. Next one is the Procore RFI statuses. So for those that uh, were aware, um, it used to have the statuses down there. Uh, and when we linked this to a Procore RFI, the statuses would be um, lost and they'd take on a Procore RFI status. So Revista has now brought on the RFI status um, bar there. And you can now see uh, how that's linked to Procore. And we also have tracking of the Revisto statuses in here too. Next up is the Z fighting. So Z fighting is uh, an issue where we've got two surfaces that are fighting for supremacy. So think, think uh, for example, a structural wall and an architectural wall. See this image on the right-hand side shows you basically we've got uh, object um, three and object two are two separate walls. And when they're aligned together in the model, they create a flickering when you look at them. Uh, and it becomes a little bit annoying, a little bit problematic when you're trying to look at the models all day, you see this flickering. So Revisto solved that by eliminating the Z fighting. Uh, and it's just made visual viewing of your models a little bit nicer. I have had a few comments from clients requesting that this be brought back because uh, people are saying that they find this useful um, when they're validating their models to understand um, whether the surfaces are aligned. So there is a, a wish list ticket out there to see if we can have a switch on to turn this on and off later on. But at the moment, um, Z fighting is gone. Next up, I'll hand over to Mike and he'll talk about that create search sets. Thanks, Matt. All right, so batch create search sets is something that a lot of people have been asking for for quite a while, and it's fantastic to have it. So it allows you to quickly and easily create search sets from specific properties, and you can identify those specific properties using the category and properties options that show at the top of this batch create search sets window. Now, where you find the window is under your search sets and under your more options. When you select that menu, it's going to give you the ability to actually see all of these options here. Um, once we've selected the category and property, which can be anything that's been loaded into the Revisto project, what we can do is then select a folder that we want to put all of these search sets into. So that can be a new folder or an existing folder. Um, you can name that however you like. You can nest it under other folders, under specific disciplines, up to you. Um, what you can then do is choose the prefix that you include for the search sets you create. So by default, the search set's name is just going to be whatever the property value is. So you could end up with some search sets that it's a bit hard to understand where they've actually come from. 
So what you might want to do is either include the category or property name, and that will show prior to the property itself, or you can put a custom value in there. So that might be an acronym or an abbreviation that actually shows before that search set in your search sets um, window. Uh, next slide, please. All right, next we have the company's department and location information that now shows in the workspace and the issue tracker and in the site app. So this information has been in Revisto for a while. You've been able to populate it in the project team and the workspace, and you've been able to filter by it in the issue tracker, but you haven't been able to easily find that information in Revisto itself. So what this allows you to do now is when you're choosing your assignee or you're trying to find who the issue should be going to in Revisto, you can actually search by the information that is associated with the user. So in the example in the middle screenshot, in that uh, search bar, I've searched for VDC, which is not a part of any of the users' names, but it is a part of the department that they are in within the specific project. So it becomes easier that you can then search by company. So if you're assigning the issue to Revisto, you can search for Revisto and find the person you want to send it to. If you want to find a specific location, you know the Auckland team or the Sydney team is looking after a specific set of issues, you can start to do that a lot more easily without jumping back into the project management, project team space or asking other users who you should be assigning issues to. Um, now, one thing to note is that this information is license specific. So if you are across multiple licenses, then you are gonna to have to have that information set up in each of those licenses. Um, it can either be added when a user is first added to the project or to license, or at any point after they have been added. And you've got full ability to adjust that and change it as necessary. Uh, next slide, please, Matt. Um, so this is exactly the same. We're just showing it in the site application. So again, available on, on Apple and Android devices. Also showing is that when we're in the issue tracker and we're looking at the information about our specific issue, we can again see very easily who is responsible for this issue, what company they're coming from, the department they're a part of, and the location that they're in. And just like in the main application, we can search in that search bar for any of those characteristics. All right, next slide, please. Uh, next up, we have a few graphic improvements. So the first one is SSAO, which if you didn't know is screen space ambient occlusion. So ambient occlusion measures the extent to which a surface is obscured from surrounding light sources. So it's basically creating small shadows and occluding things that are within your view. Now, the big change that's been made here, um, SSAO has been a part of Revisto for a while already, but there's been an improvement made in terms of how it actually appears in your 3D views. So why we're showing the 1,000 meter visibility distance down the bottom of the slide is that the lower that you have your camera visibility distance set in your preferences, the better this is going to display. So if you could please jump to the next slide, Matt. This one might be a little bit hard to see over Zoom, but this is set to 15 kilometers instead of the one kilometer it was previously. And what you can see is that that ambient occlusion starts to become a bit jagged now. So really, for a lot of our projects that are going to be buildings or smaller commercial spaces, you can absolutely bring that camera visibility distance right down. Um, for your infrastructure projects, you're probably not going to be too worried about uh, the ambient occlusion anyway. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we'll have a look at the real-time shadow improvements. So the big change here is that you can now have your real-time shadows on when you have a section plane or a section box active. So in any previous version of Revisto, the real-time shadows have been disabled as soon as you cut the section on your view. So it's really just a nice little quality of life feature there. Um, downside is that the sun is still purely set for the Northern Hemisphere and you don't have any ability to change where that sun angle is taken from. So for those of us in the Southern Hemisphere, it's still not going to be useful for actually doing anything like a sun study, but it does give you a bit more depth in your model and allows you to continue viewing it the same way if you do have those shadows on already, rather than having them flick on and off as you're using the section tool. Um, and again, the next slide is just going to show us uh, with the shadows turned off in the section. Cool. Um, the next slide is talking about some additions to advanced automation. So this is one of our big changes that's come through with the Clash automation in 5.14. And that's the ability under advanced automation to now do filter by location. So under filter by location, you have the option to choose from rooms, spaces, zones, and areas. And when you're selecting any of these, you can choose whether to include or exclude each of those different criteria. So I could choose to include certain rooms and exclude certain spaces or zones. Um, you'll notice in the bottom right of the screen as well that there's two options in terms of what is created. So you can say 
either include or exclude issues from clash groups where at least one clash belongs to the space, or you can create issues from clash groups where all of the clashes belong to those excluded spaces. So you've got a lot of control over what you can set up there. And the really good thing about the filter by location is that you can import it independently of the other automation that you have set up on a clash test. And you can just bring in that filter location, sorry, filter by location to all of your clash tests. So if you have one template test or one test where you change everything first, you could then import that to all of your other tests with advanced automation, um, whether that's 10, 20, 100, however many you want to do. Uh, and the next slide is just going to show another shot with a few more rooms and levels added. Yeah, so on the screenshot, we've got a whole heap of pieces that have been either included and excluded. Um, we can see rooms, zones, and areas are all doing inclusion criteria, whereas the spaces are doing an exclusion criteria. All right, next slide, please, Matt. All right, and then a couple of very minor things um, that you've probably missed. One thing that's been added to the issue tracker is draft comments. So draft comments basically means that you can make a comment on an issue and then you can go away, do something else, and that comment is still going to be saved there in a draft status for you to come back to later. Now, if you've done that on any issues, that is going to be indicated by the blue pencil in the bottom left corner of the issue in the issue tracker. Uh, one thing to note is that if you do close out of Revisto, unlike the visible sync button, you're not going to get any warning that you do have draft comments in your Revisto session. So if you close out, all of those draft comments are going to be gone. Um, but you can have more than one draft comment at a time. So if you're bouncing between issues, reviewing them as you're going through your meetings or any other processes, then you can have those all sitting there as drafts ready to submit later on. And last slide from me, Matt. All right, so 5.14.1 has just been made available this morning. Um, so there's a number of minor bug fixes in here, which are going to be really great for a lot of people who have uh, been early adopters of 5.14. So there's a few improvements to things like section tool, which behaved a little bit um, interestingly with clash results in the issue tracker. Um, QR codes have had a little bit of love just to make sure that the inside room function works correctly. And there's a small number of 3D bug fixes as well. Matt, I'm not sure if you're aware of anything else in 14.1 that's worth mentioning. Uh, no, I think you've covered the important ones. Yeah, okay. Cool, so that's me, and shall we carry on to the Q&A? And see there's a few questions yeah. down in the Q&A panel. Jack, are you able um, to share uh, some of the questions with us? Yeah, sure thing. Um, let me read out the questions. So the first one here from uh, Darren, I have a standard project I import all my seatings from. Can I import a set of custom status I add to to my template project to import them all to import them into all my new projects. Uh, so the issue workflow you can use to import from a project to project. So if you go up to the import settings button at the top of Revisto, there is a uh, issue workflow and you can use that to transfer it from project to project. Um, next question, can you link the stamps to the custom types and statuses so they're populated automatically? Yes. So you can do that under the stamp management accessible from the application or from the workspace. Uh, I might just share my screen over you, Matt. Yeah. Oh, actually, if you could stop sharing, I'll share mine. Thank you. All right. So hopefully that screen's coming through. So if we're looking at our stamp management, so just up here, what we can do is on the right side of the screen, I can see I have type available in the right side. If I click the pencil here, then I'm going to be able to select any of the issue types that I've set up. And then any issues that are created with those stamps will have those custom statuses available to you. Answers the question. Yep. Uh, question here from Yolanda. Will it be possible to edit the status of clashes coming from the Navisworks? So that has been raised in a few tickets already since 5.14 has been released. Um, the answer to that is no. Navisworks clashes have their own clash type, which can't be modified inside Revisto. And I think the answer is if you've got Revisto and maybe use Revisto to run your clashes, it might make things a little bit easier. 
understandably, there are some projects out there already running uh, Navis as their Clash engine, but if it makes more sense these days to run it within Revisto, if you've already got Revisto up and running. Next question, what is the actual benefit of creating QR codes? It's not really clear what you're supposed to do with them. So I'll go with one example here first, Matt, you might have another one afterwards. Um, but one thing that came out of the Brisbane field day when we had that in February was that somebody needed to create a 3D view of each of the rooms that were in their project for the room data sheet for a health authority. And in that situation, they were looking at using Enscape to generate the 3D view and an EXE standalone for each of those individual rooms. So what you could do with the QR codes out of Revisto now is actually select all of your rooms with a search set, generate an individual QR code for each of them, and then put that QR code on your room data sheet. So you don't need to generate anything additional to what's already in Revisto. You're just taking that model and providing a link to it on that room data sheet. So that's one possible use case. Um, Matt, have you got any others? Uh, the other ones that come to mind are really, um, you, you touched on them already, but is, issue, uh, well, location finding. So say you wanted to get to a certain room um, and you couldn't find yourself on the model. Some clients may paste that on the door of a plant room, something like that. If you click on that, that would take you in and you can get to that location. You may paste, uh, you've got an air handling unit on site. Uh, there's some issues related to that. You may paste a, a tag on that. You can scan that and you can bring up issues related to air handling units like that. Uh, next question from Richard. I just hope autographic view will be added to the side from the perspective view in 3D. Light on us Yep, Richard, we have your request as a feature request in our Trello board, so that one is noted. Uh, one here from Alex. What if you don't have a room or corner to align the AR? Infrastructure often doesn't have a nice corner to use. What are the other options? Uh, so you can calibrate by... So the, the recommended one is calibrate by corner, but then we have calibrate by floor, or if you're a wild person, you can just go calibrate or no calibration. But there is a there is an option in there to adjust it slightly within um, AR. There's a little adjustment button. You can move it up and down. But uh, honestly, I think calibrate by corner is the most accurate one. Um, and I find in most cases, you can find some sort of square object that you could uh, calibrate by corner. But um, if it's not working, do hit us up and we can have an individual session with you and maybe look at uh, some workflows we can help you with to get that working better. Okay. Uh, next question, QR and AR. When can we expect the QR code to be used to auto-calibrate AR based on a previous calibration? Yeah, so that has been raised as a feature request. Hopefully it's something we'll see come through with version 5.15 or 5.16, but there's no set date on that yet but it has been requested. Um, uh, I noted draft comments as a new feature. Is there also draft chat? Sometimes I need to edit a chat attached to an issue. So I think the answer to this one is that um, all of your comments are happening in the chat. Um, when you're talking about modifying an existing comment, we don't have that feature at the moment and I don't think it's planned for them to be editable. I could be wrong there. Matt, I'm not sure if you've heard differently. Uh, no, I think I think if you log a comment, you have a window in which you can edit it um, from memory. Um, but once it's over a minute or so, that comment uh, is is locked in. So um, <clears throat> yeah, once once they're they're locked in officially, you can't edit them. Yeah, I know that has been requested as well with being able to delete markups and irrelevant comments from some issues. Um, certainly not all comments were meant to be made or people want to change the information there so that it's not all accessible in the same way. So yeah, I think it has been requested for a couple of different features. Uh, question here from Ian. In the issue tracker section, you get the numerical notification of issues that have been edited at the top of the application. Version 5.13 will filter these updated issues at the top of the issue list until you've viewed them. Version 5.14 seems to have changed the setting as the sorting order unread button does not seem to be the same way. Is it something I needed to reset? 
All right, I think I have the answer to that one. Um, I'm pretty sure that was a bug and that that's been addressed in version 5.14.1. So if you download that and have a look in there, Ian, hopefully that'll be resolved already. It is noted under the uh, release notes that now when sorting by unread first is applied, only relevant issues are displayed at the top. So hopefully that resolves that issue. Uh, another question here, can we add multiple sections and dimensions similar to Trimble command? Section box or section plane, they're your two options at the moment. So if and, you want to add multiple, use a section box and you can cut it, but they're your only options yeah. at the moment. And then multiple dimensions is something that's been requested and is on our feature request board. Another one here from Michael, great presentation. Can you clarify how the Z flighting is determined? i.e. which element has priority and can we define it? Uh, that's a good question. I had to ask the developers around that recently. Uh, I actually think it is, um, there's there's no real um, hierarchy. It's, it comes down to which model I think is actually loaded into Revisto first, which surface gets the hierarchy, but there is um, not real any, uh, any logic really behind it apart from the hierarchy of the models from what I understand. Another one with AR, can we cut section and measure? Not at the moment, no. You can um, just visualize the model. I haven't cut a section and measured. I thought we could, but now I'm going to have to check. Um, you can definitely do appearance templates through AR. So you can have your view set up to um, be in the correct location and then shift between two appearance templates that maybe don't have walls or the geometry you've actually used to locate yourself. Um, I'd have to check that on the side and get an answer back to you. Yeah. If you have any questions um, that we can't answer in, in here, feel free to uh, reach out to Michael or myself and we can organize a session with you after this and we're happy to work. Uh, spend some time going through some of these topics or looking at these workflows in a little bit more detail. Um, will it be possible in the future to filter by status change debt? I know there has been a feature request to filter by um, update dates. So quite possibly. I think that'll just be captured somewhere in the custom filters that you'll then be able to set it up to filter to something as specific as a certain status change. Uh, for the advanced automation filter by location function, we apply the filters onto all clash tests in the project in bulk all at once. Yes, so maybe that's one that's worth demoing on screen. Um, We'll risk a live demo and see how it goes. All right, so I'll chuck that up there. Um, so if we're looking at our issue automation and let's say that I just set this up on this test. So checking out my clash, sorry, my clash test, um, looking at the issue automation, switch it to advanced automation. And what I want to do is add a filter by location. So I'll say this is first floor and ground floor. And I'm not gonna worry too much about these settings at the moment. And I'm then going to relinquish this test. Now, if I go and select a number of other tests, what I'm going to do is import the settings from the clash test. So I want to go check those out, import settings. What I'm going to do is find that hydraulic versus hydraulic copy that I have. And what I can see under here is I have advanced issue automation rules and location filters. So because these issues are advanced automation at the moment, it's probably going to pull that in as well. No, nope, sorry, I stand corrected. Um, we can import the location filters independently. And it's going to take whatever simple or advanced automation the clash test has set up currently and then apply the location filters to that. So as we've just seen, I've set up, um, what did I set up? I set up first floor and ground floor on here currently. I can see that this one currently has nothing on it. So it's simple automation and it doesn't have any filter by location. If I select all of these tests, I go import settings, select my hydraulic versus hydraulic, and then select location filters going to update each of those. And I can see now if I select this one that it has shifted to be advanced automation. And at the top, it has the filter by location levels. So, yes. Uh, 
Next question for Revista subscribers. Is it possible to get just one exam browser? On what? Sorry? Exam browser. Richard, I assume this is talking about certification. Um, certification level one and two will be available for free at Revista Unplugged events. So we have our Unplugged event coming up this Friday in Sydney. Um, there's going to be one of those events per region per year. So we'll find another location to be able to host that next year. Right. Um, question from Karen Lamb. On a previous project, we used QR codes in health services to check required furniture and fittings were included in the room. We would compare the data in the QR code against the actual items in the completeness. I think that's just a comment about maybe a previous question. Mm, about a use case. Okay. Uh, one from Oscar. Will a Windows Select tool be available soon? Ideally, or usually select inspection section boxes and cover abilities. Yep. Uh, so that, that one's... A... Sorry, Michael. Yeah. You go. I'll let you take it. Uh, yeah, I believe there's a wish list uh, request for that already. So um, it's being discussed and there's a ticket for that, but unfortunately there's nothing at the moment. Handful of questions later. I wish there is a way to show model iteration between model revisions in Revista. Is there a way? This is also a wish list item, which is one of the big ticket items for Revista's development this year. So hopefully we'll see it before the end of 2024. Um, will the updated Procore integration alter the RFI workflow for both past and future projects, or is it solely applicable to future projects? Um, so that's a good question. I think I may have to, who, who uh, asked that question? If they want to touch base Sean, with me afterwards. Sean Wang. Sean, okay. We'll, we'll reach out to you afterwards and just calibrate, uh, um, confirm with that one because I'm uh, not 100% sure. So if Sean can um, contact me after the session, um, <clears throat> then we can go into that a bit deeper. Yeah, another one from Sean here. At the request of one of our quantity surveyors, will this update enable the rule measurement feature to perform area measurements? Oh, from 3D? I don't think so. Mm. Okay, touch base after that one as well. Yeah. Um, uh, a question about uh, certification. Can I attend a level two certification on Friday in Sydney, but I haven't attended the level one certification? So uh, regarding certification, level one is a prerequisite for level two, as far as I understand. But if you're attending yep. on Friday, you can get both on the same day. Uh, just a final comment. Great presentation. Looking forward to trying out the AR feature. Thank you. All right, and when you do try it out, post your results on LinkedIn, share them around, and um, yeah, we'd love to see them. Um, yeah, if you can just, uh, yeah, there you go. So you see uh, my email there and you see Michael's email. If you guys want to um, screenshot that and send us an email, we, you can contact us after this and we can discuss any of these topics further with you or look into deploying some custom statuses with you. Uh, so yeah. thanks. Absolutely. Thank you to everyone who's joined the webinar today. Um, as Matt and Michael said, um, please do reach out to them. Please do follow us on our socials, especially on LinkedIn, where you get all the information. And uh, as we said at the very start as well, this webinar will be shared uh, by email. i um, not sure exactly how long, in the next 24 hours, hopefully. And uh, you'll be able to watch it back and share it with uh, any other people that you know who'd be interested. Thank you again to everyone for joining. Thank you to our speakers, Michael and Matt. And uh, I hope everyone has a lovely day. All right. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Bye.